What we invite everyone to do now is to mute yourselves and we'll do the introduction. The Telebration Proclamation. In the name of storytelling, the National Storytelling Network and the Foothills Storytelling Guild and South Bay Storytellers and Listeners are proud sponsors of Celebration, the worldwide event of storytelling in the course of this month across six continents in at least 40 states and nine countries from Sacramento to Savannah, Boise to Barcelona, West Virginia to the West Indies, over 300 audiences will gather for spectacular storytelling events. So without further delay, in joy and anticipation, let the storytelling begin. We are Tom and Sandy Farley of South Bay Storytellers and Listeners, and we're delighted to share this celebration with the Foothill Storytelling Guild. 2021 marks the 30th consecutive annual celebration of South Bay Storytellers and Listeners. Uh, this is where the live audience would all break into applause. Mm -hmm. Thunderous applause, of course. <laughs> now, our first teller comes from the Foothill Storytelling Guild. Mark Berry is going to MC for their share of the program. We're going to interleaf the tellers like this from the two groups. Go, Mark. Thank you, Sandy and Tom. What a treat it is to see new, new faces and I know I'm going to hear new tellers tonight. I'm very excited about that. I am Mark Berry, one of the founding members of the Foothills Storytelling Guild. And I see uh, Sherry and, and Linda Rella are both here also. And so it is an honor to share in this combined celebration, combining our two groups. The Foothills Storytelling Guild centers around Auburn, California, and the Sierra Foothills. And I would like to introduce our first teller this evening, is one of my favorites, and his name is Eric Hurt. And Eric started telling with our guild in 2018. He has a hobby podcast called tellingsimple.com, and it's written in the uh, chat in case you want to check it out. He likes telling ghost stories and stories from California's past as well as tall tales. He won our Liars Contest, our annual event, two years in a row. And his story this evening will bring together the creepiness of Halloween with the hungry appetites of Thanksgiving. Take it away, Eric. Hello, everyone. Hello there. Hi. So just to begin, so down, down the road from where I live, it wasn't too long ago, there was a boarding house that took in people who I guess had no place to go. It was, well, the boarding house was thought to be the coldest place around. Something about there being seven below, seven people buried in the ground. Now, when people go by that home today, that boarding house, some say it, it still gives them the chills but uh, once upon a time, it was a warm place where those who needed a place to stay were welcomed in. Now, the boarding house was run by a sweet lady. She uh, could have been someone's grandmother. She had cloudy white hair. She was the landlady and she was well-to-do. She had pictures on her walls of governors and bishops and uh, some were standing with her, some were dancing beside her. And well, she was, well, she, she was known for doing these wonderful acts of kindness because she liked to take care of others. She also liked to cook and she was known for being very generous with her homemade meals. She'd make such things as, uh, you know, a barbecue ribs, liver and onions, kidney pie. Now that was a house favorite, as well as these little finger sandwiches. She would spend hours just carving them up, just making them just right, you know, bite size. For the people that went to stay or live at this boarding house, they ended up there this way. Someone from the city would pull up to the house in their car, and then an older person would step out, somebody who was later in years. And this person, well, they were down in their luck. They had no place to go. They were someone that no one would really remember. 
and they would climb up the steps, bags, bags packed, and they'd be greeted at the door by the sweet landlady with a welcome in. They'd be given a room, they'd be given meals throughout the day. And once a month, the landlady would take their mail and she would take their retirement checks and she would go and cash them. She would take out what she thought was belonged to her and then she would give them whatever was left over, which was very little or sometimes nothing at all. She made about $5,000 a month by running her boarding house this way. And if one of the older persons complained, well, after a month or two or possibly three, they would disappear. Then the room would come empty, it would be made ready for the next guest. And then someone from the city would pull up in front of the boarding house with a car, an older person would step up, climb the steps with their bags packed, and they'd be greeted at the front door by the sweet lady with the, the cloudy white hair. This went on for, for quite a while. Now, when you have a boarding house, there are only so many people that you can that can fit in a house. And in time, this landlady, well, she hired someone, a man to, to help her, to be her handyman, somebody who lived on the street, someone who had no home. And with a handful of cash, he went about digging holes under her home, holes in her backyard, you know, holes long enough that you could lay down in. And now something, one day something happened. And, I don't know if maybe the handyman said something, complained about something, or maybe the people that lived in the home, maybe they were extra hungry. But one day the handyman, he disappeared. Now, not too long after this, someone from the city drove up to the house in their car. And it's true that at this time, one of the rooms was, was ready to rent. And the landlady, she went to the door with a, hello, 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 but there was no one there. There was no one walking up her steps uh, with bags in hand. There was no one, no older person standing, stepping out of the car. The only one to get out of the car was a driver and the driver was looking for someone they had dropped off some months before. Someone that they couldn't find anymore. The, the, the landlady believed that, well, they had left town, but the driver thought that very strange. So the driver called the police and the police came out and they searched around. They, they went into the home and those that were living there, they seemed, you know, they seemed you know, safe, sound. And then the police went into the backyard. Now at this time, there were no holes in the ground. The backyard looked like anyone else's backyard. But there was something, everything looked fine, except the police found something strange. The ground, it looked like the dirt had been turned over and it, the ground was softer in some places than others. Remember at the start of the story when I told you that the, the boarding house was the coldest place around that because of it being the, the, the seven below? Well, the police, they grabbed their shovels and they dug down and up came a head, a head of one of the older persons. Well, they moved over and they dug down and this time they dug up a leg with a foot and a, still wearing a shoe and the shoelaces were, were still tied. And then the police, they moved over and they dug down, but this time they found a, a body, a whole body, head, shoulders, knees and toes. That's right, knees and toes, eyes and ears and, well, you know. The landlady, her name was Dorothea Puente. Now, all kidding aside, she never cooked up any of her victims, at least none that we know about. She was convicted of nine crimes, nine murders, and she spent the rest of her life in jail. Now. She had the, the, uh, um, the habit of dropping one too many pills into her victim's drinks at night, and then those victims found themselves dead out in a hole somewhere. I heard that Dorothea Puente died a few years ago in jail. Some say natural causes, maybe she choked on some food. But rumor has it that she was working on a book uh, behind bars, uh, a book that she never finished. It was to be, it was a cookbook. And it said that if she had published this cookbook, it would, it would have made the bestsellers list. It was, it was called Running a Boarding House, How to Serve Others. And the first recipe, a soup, it was called Cream of, of Esophagus. And I heard that if you made it just right, it was to die for. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. You made me laugh again. I love it. Great. Thanks for letting me share. 
Okay. And back to you, Tom and Sandy. Um, Joy Swift is going to be our first teller. Uh, Joy has long been the guiding light, uh, mother hen, foundation rock, um, whatever metaphor fits for the, our storytelling circle of connections. She told at Celebration in 1992, has been involved in celebrations ever since. Uh, she's mentored several new tellers, young and old, who've been a part of South Bay Storytellers and Listeners. Recently, Joy heard us part of a story in a TV ad, but she felt bad that the whole story wasn't told. It was originally intended to be read to children. And so tonight, Joy Swift brings us The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde. The children played in a giant's garden. It was such a beautiful garden. And on their way home from school, they always stopped. They played there. The trees would bloom in the spring and peaches would appear in the fall and flowers grew and the birds sang so sweetly that the children would stop playing just to listen to the birds sing. But one day the giant came home. He had been visiting the Gorka Cornwall and had been gone for seven years. He finally finished what he had to say. And he saw the children playing in the garden and he said, what are you doing here? And the children ran away. He said, this is my garden and I can do with my garden what I wish and built a wall around the garden. And the trees did not bloom anymore. The grass did not grow. The flowers went back into the ground to rest. And winter came, and the snow came, and the giant put up a sign that trespassers would be prosecuted. But the snow and the frost and the sleet and the north wind came and blew in that garden, and it was never beautiful again, and there was no singing, and the giant became very sad. He was a very selfish giant. But one day he woke up to a, a beautiful sound and he couldn't figure out what it was. He hadn't heard it in so long. He thought maybe the king's band was coming by the road outside. But he got up and he opened up the window and there was a little bird singing in his garden. And there were children, they had found a hole in the wall and they came in and they were playing again and the trees were blooming and everyone was so happy. And he realized how selfish he'd been and he ran downstairs and yet in one corner was one tree that was still surrounded by the snow and the sleet in the north wind and was cold. And there was a little boy standing at the base of that tree, trying to get up into the tree like the other children, but he could not. The tree bent its branches as low as it could, but still the boy could not get in. So the giant picked the little boy up and placed him up in the tree. And when he did, the, west, the north wind went away the tree went into blossom, and the children saw how nice the giant was now. And they came back in and started playing, and the giant took an axe and tore the wall down and told the children they could play there forever and ever. Please come and play. And he would go down and he would play with them every day until he got so old and feeble he finally just sat in an armchair and watched them and laughed and talked to them. But every day he would ask about the little boy because the little boy didn't show up again. And nobody knew who he was or where he lived. And he, but he kept coming every 
the giant kept looking every day for the little boy. And one day he looked down and there was the little boy sitting in the tree and the tree was in blossom. And he ran down to see the little boy. The little boy had kissed him when he first put him in the tree. And he never forgot that kiss. They got down and he saw the little boy. And he, he saw that the little boy had no nail holes in his hands and his feet. And he said, who did this to you? I will take the sword and I will kill them. And the little boy said, nay, nay. These are symbols of love. One day I came and you let me play in your garden. Now today you can go with me and play in my garden, which is paradise. And when the children came to play that day, they found the giant under the tree dead, covered with blossoms. Thank you. You've probably heard the ad on television and it just tells a brief piece of that. I just couldn't stand it. I had to look up and see what the whole story was. It was on during the, the World Series, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Uh, Jean Ellison, you have an announcement for us? You do I'm that and then we'll go I'm to Mark. Yeah. I'm unmuting myself. Great. Da -da 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 -da! Announcement, announcement. The Storytelling Association of California is honoring our beloved Joy Swift to be SAC's regional gem for 2022 with a celebratory concert on Saturday, March 12th on Zoom. Stay tuned for the next storyline for all the details. Congratulations, Joy, we love you. Well deserved. Congratulations, Joy. <clears throat> well Thanks. done. Thank you. Up to you. Our next storyteller uh, needs to unmute herself, Miss Sherry. And <laughs> Sherry grew up in New Mexico with many aunts and uncles and cousins. And she remembers listening to the grown-ups talking about the day's happenings at the end of the day. And the stories often had a moral to pass on to the children. Sometimes there would be a funny tale or a tall tale and this is the spirit in which Sherry Anderson tries to express in her stories. And her story today is about her Aunt Remy. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to tell you about my Aunt Remy. Uh, her name was actually Remington. I never quite figured out how she got named after a rifle because she was kind of a a red-headed pistol instead of a rifle kind of person. Um, she uh, came to live with us. She was my daddy's youngest sister. And when I was in junior high, Aunt Remy, who was already out of high school, she came to live with us. And uh, we became great friends. She took me everywhere she went. And one day we were sitting at the soda fountain having uh, Root, root beer floats. Y'all remember root beer floats? We were having a root beer float and this fellow came and he, he sat down on the, on the stool on the other side of Aunt Remy and they're chatting back and forth. And I kind of looked over at to see what the cat had dragged in and he seemed like a nice enough young man. He, uh, he had curly black hair and sparkly blue eyes. Three days later, Aunt Remy married him and he became my Uncle Billy. Now Aunt Remy and Uncle Billy, they traveled all around New Mexico there for a, a year or so, drilling oil wells here and there and getting very rich. And then one day, sad to say, Uncle Billy was standing in the wrong place when a gusher came in and he went up with it and he came down. It was a very nice funeral. Aunt Remy was just heartbroken. She came home 
and she just moped around for months and months. One day, I saw a poster, and it said the circus was coming to town. And Aunt Rini and I, we love the circus. So I convinced her to come take me to the circus. So we're at the circus, and there's the trapeze, and there's the acrobats. But my favorite part is the trick ponies. They go around and around. Of course, the ponies don't do any tricks. It's the guy on the back of the ponies that's doing all the tricks. Nice young man with curly black hair and sparkly blue eyes. So we stayed after the circus to kind of visit with him. And three days later, Aunt Remy married him and he became my Uncle Bob. Now, Aunt Remy and Uncle Bob, they traveled around with the circus for a while, and, and they just had a great time. We'd get letters from all over. And then, sad to say, one day, Uncle Bob was standing in the wrong place when an elephant backed up, and, well, it was a very nice funeral. Aunt Remy came home again, and, and she was bummed for months and she just she just wasn't getting out of it she just wasn't herself and one day daddy saw that there was one of those tent religious shows that travel around and it was there and in, in town and and that's what daddy thought he thought maybe what aunt Remy needs is a good dose of religion so we all dressed up and we went to the to the service that evening. Now it was so much fun. There was clapping and there was stomping and singing and all the hallelujah. And then the preacher came out. I was listening to what the preacher was saying. Aunt Remy was just listening to the preacher. He was a nice young fellow with curly black hair and sparkly blue eyes. Three days later, Aunt Remy married him, and he became my Uncle Joe. So Aunt Remy and Uncle Joe, they traveled around New Mexico with this, with this tent um, religious services, and, and everything was fine, except, sad to say, one day Uncle Joe was baptizing down at the river, and nobody asked him if he could swim. And he slid off of the rock and he was down and around the bend. And well, it was a very nice funeral. And Aunt Remy came home again. She was bummed. She just moped around for months. And then one day she came out of her room and she made an announcement. She was never going to get married again. Well, we thought, thank goodness, that was great. So I grew up, went off to college, got married, and on her birthday, I never failed to give Aunt Remy a phone call. So last time I talked to her, I called her up and I says, Aunt Remy, how are things in Grinder Switch? And she says, well, darling, let me tell you, I'm going to get married again. Oh, yes, I'm going to marry someone I've known for a very long time. I'm going to marry the funeral director. Now, here I am. I'm on the other end in California listening to my beloved Aunt Remy. And I, I just didn't want her to make a mistake. And I says, Aunt Remy, now you married an oil man. You married a circus performer. You married a, a preacher, and now you're going to marry a funeral director? And it was very quiet for a moment. Then Aunt Remy says, yes, darling, you might say, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <laughs> Jay, a wonderful ending. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I, I, I have to tell you that 
Eric has beat me in the tall tale stories a couple of times. And, you know, I'm practicing my tall tales. So I appreciate, appreciate the audience tonight. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Well, you had us laughing. <laughs> Okay, our next teller uh, is going to be Jim Cockrell. He's a member of South Bay Storytellers and Listeners who, through his docent connections, created the Big Basin Storytelling Festival at our oldest state park. Unfortunately, that event has been in suspension for two years as a result of a devastating fire. I think you folks in the foothills understand about devastating fires. Um, at any rate, uh, he and his wife, Becky, live in Santa Cruz, and tonight um, uh, Jim is going to tell us uh, a Greek myth of Theseus and Aegeus. Thank you, Sam. Jim. <laughs> Thank you. So let me tell you about Theseus. Theseus grew up without a father at home, so as a consequence, he used to get beat up a lot by the bullies. Uh, you know, that's how it was in uh, eighth century BC Trozen. You didn't have a father, you got called names, got beat up on the playground. So Theseus had to learn how to fight and boy howdy did he learn how to fight. Over the years, he became the most powerful young kid there in Trozen. And by the time he was a young man, he said Trozen wasn't big enough to hold him. Theseus' mother said, son, it's time for me to tell you about your real dad. You see, he wanted to be here with you, but for complications, it just wasn't possible. You see, your father is King Aegeus, the king of Athens, the most powerful man in Southern Greece. So even though he couldn't be here, he left you these, these gifts. And Theseus, look where hidden, he found King Aegeus' royal sword and his royal shoes. And Theseus said, I'm, I'm going to Athens, and I'm going to see my father, King Aegeus. And Theseus determined to take the overland route against all counsel because the road between Trozen and Athens was populated by highway robbers who were so mean, vicious, and cruel that they'd be willing to slit your throat just to steal your bronze belt buckle. But Theseus took that route anyway. And each and every one of those villains he met, he defeated by hand, by mostly using his wits and turning the robbers' own, own weapons against him. So that by the time Theseus arrived several days later in Athens, his reputation had preceded him in the palace of King Aegeus. One of the counselors came and said, uh, your majesty, uh, there's a upstart young hero who's just arrived in Athens. People are talking about him. Seems uh, he has done a, um, a volunteer job of increasing the safety of the road from Trozen to Athens. And perhaps you ought to invite him to the palace for a, some kind of reward. And King Aegeus agreed that would be the thing to do. Theseus was arrived and when, was invited and arrived in the courtyard. And immediately, King Aegeus recognized the shoes. Boy, come here. Where did you get those shoes? They're yours, father. I'm your son. I'm Theseus. King Aegeus broke all protocol and embraced the boy that he'd never met. And there was a homecoming celebration like you wouldn't believe with feasting in the palace. And Aegeus told everyone, this is my boy, my firstborn. This man, he's going to be the heir to the throne. And it was a happy homecoming as the two got to know each other. But coincidentally, it was a couple of days later that Theseus noticed that Athenians were preparing for an event in the streets wearing black clothing. And King Aegeus had to explain, son, this is the day of tribute. You see, many, many years ago, we were at war with Crete and there was a siege 
and the Athenians were dying. And I had to negotiate the peace with King Minos of Crete. And the price of peace was this. Every nine years, we must pay tribute to Crete by sending seven of our best men and seven of our best women on a slave ship, never to return. That's outrageous, said Theseus. I'm going to put a stop to that. Son, when you're old enough, you'll understand the needs of the many versus the needs of the few. No, this isn't acceptable. I'm going. I'm volunteering. Let me go. You're my son. You'll send other sons. I'm just getting to know you. And outside, the crowd heard that Theseus had volunteered. Send the hero. Send the boy. Send Theseus. And of course, Aegeus couldn't say no. He reluctantly agreed, Theseus, you go. You go on the slave ship to Crete. Just do this one thing for me. The ship sails with a black flag. When the ship returns, exchange that black flag for a white flag, and I'll know you've succeeded and you survived. But if I see a black flag, I'll know you're not going to return. Theseus agreed, and there was a long, long sea voyage with the other captives, the other tribute Athenians. When they arrived at Crete, there, evil King Minos greeted them himself. Ah, my tribute has arrived. Welcome. And Theseus walked right up to him and said, I am Theseus, son of King Aegeus, and I'm here to put a stop to this tribute. We'll no longer be your slaves. King Minos said, slaves, <laughs> you have the wrong impression. You're not here as a slave. You're here to go visit my beast, the Minotaur, in my labyrinth beneath my castle. You're here as human sacrifice. And since you're the son of King Aegeus, I think tomorrow morning you'll go first. Ha, 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 ha. So Theseus was led away with the other Athenians to the jail, into the dungeon. Well, King Minos had a daughter named Adriane, and she had been there in the court that day and saw Theseus' bravery. The brash young man impressed her. In fact, she was falling for him, and that night she bribed the guards to come into the jail. She snuck to Theseus and said, Theseus, I'll give you the keys to escape the labyrinth. But if I do, you have to promise that when you defeat the Minotaur, and I know you will, that you'll take me with you and the other Athenians on your return to Athens. I need to get out of this place. And of course, Theseus agreed. So she slipped into his pocket a spool of thread and disappeared. First thing in the morning, the guards came to Theseus and marched him to the labyrinth. No one had ever escaped the labyrinth. King Minos told him, if for some reason by a miracle of Zeus that the uh, Minotaur, my monster, were somehow to uh, be defeated by you, you'd probably die of hunger in the labyrinth. It's such a devious maze that no one's ever made it out alive. Theseus waited till the guards turned away and tied the string to the door and then spooled it out as he entered the labyrinth deeper and deeper in search of the lair of the Minotaur. It was easy to follow. Theseus followed the smell, the smell of the decaying victims, and he could hear the beast groaning and moaning within. And at last he turned around a corner and there he was confronted by the hideous Minotaur. So terrible that I can't explain it to you. The Minotaur is half man, and with the head of a bull, complete with huge horns, a bull's nose, ring in his nostrils, and beady red eyes. And when the Minotaur saw Theseus, it licked its lips and rubbed its human hands together, got down on hands and knees, head forward, and charged immediately. Theseus waited. He waited for the bull to approach. And at the very last second, Theseus grabbed the bull by the horns, which is, I think, where we get that expression, flung himself over the back of the hideous monster and clung onto the back for dear life 
as the monster bucked left and right and twisted and writhed. Theseus held onto the horns with all his might and the monster shook his head and Theseus hands held, but one horn broke off in his hand and he was flung against the wall. As he slid down, the monster turned and faced him once again, and Theseus' back was against a column. The bull crouched down, head first, and charged full speed. And Theseus waited with his eyes open. At the very last second, he held that bull's horn against the column and stepped aside as the bull impaled himself on his own horn and died. Well, it was easy for Theseus to follow the thread to escape the labyrinth. And there was Adriana at the opening where she, just as she said, and together they released the other Athenian prisoners. And in the cover of darkness at night, they slipped out to the port where they burned the entire Cretan Navy before boarding their own Athenian slave ship and making their escape. They sailed many days and had to pull into the port of Naxos for water and food. And there at Naxos, it was revealed to Theseus in a dream. Poseidon told him, Adriana is not what she seems. She is actually a saboteur. And Theseus was heartbroken and distraught. And he took his skeleton crew, he took his men and the women from Athens and slipped away and abandoned Adriana there. They boarded the ship abruptly and departed in the middle of the night back to Athens. And they made the long voyage till finally a lookout said, land, I see the coast, I see the coast of Greece. There on the coast of Greece, King Aegis had made a vigil. Every single day he had taken his chariot and his entourage and gone to a bluff above the sea where he had a view of the entire sea and he could see the horizon. And every single day that Theseus was gone, King Aegeus scanned the ocean to look for him. And there finally someone shouted, a ship! It's the Athenian slave ship! Here they, here they come! What color is the flag? Theseus in his in his despondence and the abruptness of his departure had failed to raise the white flag. It was flying the black one. And King Aegeus said, he who does not return, my son, my son whom I had only just begun to know, my son whom I didn't see grow up, my son for whom I'm responsible descending to his death. And the king turned on that bluff and threw himself off the cliff and into the sea. When Theseus arrived in Athens, the city was in complete chaos. There was rejoicing and celebration because Theseus and the Athenians had defeated the Cretan navy, but there was mourning and grief for their great king, the first great king of Athens, King Aegeus. And Theseus inherited the throne and he, he sat on the throne for the rest of his life and everyone agreed even to this day that he was a just and powerful king who raised Athens to greater heights. But the people of Athens also remember King Aegeus for they named that piece of the sea where he had fallen as we still call it to this very day, 2,600 years later, the Aegean Sea. And that's the story of Theseus and Aegeus. Thank you, Jim Cockrell. You're welcome. Jim, well told. Now, we have another member of the Foothill Storytelling Guild, and his name is Mark Berry. Hi, this is Mark, and I'm going to share a story with you. I'm I discovered storytelling at the knee of my grandfather. I only had one grandfather and one grandmother because the other two died before I was born. So we had pretty special relationship. And my grandfather was a cowboy. And he, uh, in his youth, he herded the doggies on his pony from the Oregon Trail to Kansas City to the railhead. Boy, did he have stories. And boy, was I hooked. Before I went to school, I could sit all day and listen to his stories. This story, is about my grandmother, the only one I ever knew. 
Ma Berry, as we all called her, had five kids, including my father. And except for my father, they were prolific. I had lots of cousins and second cousins. And I knew somehow that I was my grandmother's favorite. You see, we loved each other with a love that was unspoken. We didn't have to say, I love you all the time. We knew, we had such patience for each other ever since I was born. She and I could have a wonderful time doing nothing at all. And then when we did something, it was even more wonderful. I remember a time when I was about eight years old and she was visiting us and she accidentally got a splinter in one of her fingers. And this wasn't a nice little toothpick. This was a nasty splinter and it did not look, look well at all. Now, my parents offered to remove the splinter, but Grandma Barry said, no, let's let Mark do it. Well, I'm eight years old. I don't have eye-hand coordination or anything like my parents. I've never dealt with a wound before, but for her, I would do anything. So I was struggling to hold the, uh, the glass in one hand and, and hold some tweezers or something in the other hand and grab hold of that little stick that was in my grandmother's finger that was all red and sore and looking terrible. And I did my best. I know it wasn't the cleanest job anyone could ever do, but I did my best and I got the splinter out. She didn't feel a thing. Fast forward to when I was 19 years old, I went up to live in Northern Idaho where all my relatives are from. I decided to take a year of college there and get a job and see if I might wanna live where all my ancestors had always lived. At that time, she was in a nursing home and it, it wasn't a nice one. It had that, that odor that you've heard about. I hope you've never smelled it. And on Saturdays was my day to go visit grandma. And I had my little old clunker car with the used retread tires on it that 19 year old kids had back then. And I'd go visit Grandma Barry in her home and I couldn't wait to get her out of there. Let's go out and get some fresh air. Let's go out and see some scenery. Let's talk and enjoy the day and let me take you to lunch. Well, the only thing she ever wanted was a plain hamburger. I don't know how she choked it down. It was just a patty between two halves of a bun. But that was what she wanted. I said, I'll, I'll take you anywhere. I'll take you to the Chinese restaurant, anywhere you want to go. Nope, want my plain hamburger. And she looked forward to that as much as I looked forward to seeing her. So we had our plain hamburger. And she didn't have much to talk about because life was the same one day to another where she lived. But I had a lot to talk about. Oh, I had such weight on my shoulders as a 19-year-old young man trying to figure out what to do about girls and trying to figure out what to do about holding a job and how to manage my studies and college and get grades and head on towards a career, all those things that a person of that age is dealing with, those heavy burdens. And I talked and she listened and with such compassion and kindness that it really did both of us a world of good. And every Saturday when we'd finish that, I'd drop her back off at her home and her room. And every time she'd, she'd peel off a little piece of paper from something or other and she'd write something on it and tuck, tuck it in my shirt pocket and we hugged goodbye and later when I had time I would pull out that slip of paper and read it and it was always a bible verse it was book chapter and verse so I'd get out the family bible and I'd look it up book chapter and verse and you know that the reading that she gave me every single time was a reading from the bible that really helped me. It helped calm my fears or it helped uplift my spirits. It was just exactly what I needed. She never gave me the same one twice. She knew her Bible and she knew her grandson. And well, quite a few years later, she passed away and I was there, of course. And after the funeral, we had the reception and there were uh, big tables and my parents and all of the people that age went over to their table and my cousins and all the people our age, quite a few of us, we went over to our table. And my poor cousin, Kathy, she was a little younger than I, and uh, she was just distraught. She was just sobbing and just, oh, she had such a hard time. And in between the sobs, she accidentally let the words slip out. And I know I was her favorite. And then she realized what she said. My eyes looked around that table 
And all of my cousin's eyes were looking around that table. And when we compared notes, we found out that Grandma Barry had each of us convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were her favorite grandchild. And it just wouldn't be nice to tell the others. So I have two grandsons now. And my goal and my intention is to try and be as good a grandpa as my grandmother was to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was lovely. And I'm sure you were the favorite. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we all were. <laughs> my father my, uh, told my brother that he was uh, his favorite son and I was his favorite daughter. And of course, there were only the two of us. <laughs> Our next teller is Becky Blythe. You saw her sitting uh, next to, to Jim as he was telling a Greek myth. She's got a story um, that I, I think I asked her to tell because I love it so much. But uh, first I gotta tell you that Becky Blythe is a, an amazing outdoor woman who's had all kinds of adventures. She has taught, she has fought forest fires and all that kind of stuff. And one of the amazing coincidences that happened was at their wedding uh, that Becky and, and, and Jim invited us to host at their MC at their wedding and we told at the reception us at their wedding reception and we told the story of the owl and the pussycat. And when we got to the line, um, oh, let us be married too long we have tarried. The whole room broke out in laughter. <laughs> and many years later, on a bluff overlooking the farthest south point in the United States on the island of Hawaii, Big Island, the Big Island. Uh, we met a couple who had stopped to look at the view also, driving the rental car, and we had a rental car, and where were they from? They were from California, and they said, you guys look familiar. Where do we know you from? They'd been at the wedding. <laughs> who knew? Yeah. Anyway. What storytelling gets you, yes. yeah. Storytelling gets you, they remembered us because we told that story. So anyway, Becky's going to tell us the story of One-Eyed Charlie. It's a wonderful story. Listen carefully. This story takes place in the 1850s in Gold Rush, California. When you arrived in the gold fields, you'd first start in San Francisco as you boarded a ship and head up to Sacramento. In Sacramento, there would be stagecoaches lined up calling out the name of the gold mine town they were headed to, Rough and Ready, Growlersburg, Nevada City, Nugget. But stagecoaches were magnificent things. Built out of wood and sitting on leather thorough braces, they rocked gently so that the horses were not jerked around. They had six horses that were under the control of the reinsmen who sat on top of the box on top of the stagecoach. And these were no ordinary men. It took years and years and years of training and an artistry and dexterity that can be compared to a concert pianist. First of all, six horses, six reins, and they put one rein between each finger. And then they had been trained to work the reins independently by working it up, gathering it up slowly between two fingers and loosening another one and then holding tight a third one so that every rein was managed and manipulated independently, but lightly. The horses only felt the slightest twinge to hear the command of what they needed to do in their mouth. They were never jerked around and so they never developed calluses. To an outsider, looking at the stagecoach's hands as he manipulated the horses, you would think that he was doing nothing because it was so effortless looking, but it took years of training. There was also a whip and the whip was the symbol of the rainsmen. And each year that they were able to work, they got a, a silver ring on their um, whip. The whip never touched the horses. The whip was used strategically and expertly in one of the hands. 
to signal the horses what to do, slightly to the left of the leader, slightly above the other leader, things like that. Just to move the horses um, for a turn, they would take the reinsmen had to control them independently to take the lead horses out into the middle of an intersection and then gently get one of them to start turning and then turn the second one and get the second pair of horses to go forward before they turn. All this manipulation to prevent tip over of the stagecoach. Of all the stagecoach drivers, and they had character names, and they were all characters and well-known. Some of them were known for their humor, but all of them were known for their great skill. But the most skillful of all was a man named Charlie Parkhurst. And Charlie had arrived in the gold fields from back east where he'd been trained. Middle age, which in those days was around 30. And he was already experienced. So he got a job easily with Wells Fargo. He became one of their most trusted stagecoach drivers. So trusted that one time they sent him all the way to New York with a substantial load of gold. It was an honor to get such a position. There were lots of dangers on the trails up in the mother load of California and on the California coast where Charlie ran stages. And the stage roads were rough. They were built in the canyons of the rivers. They were blasted out of, out of um, with dynamite out of the granite. So boulders were a constant danger. And the roads were no smooth, straightforward thing. They were filled with ruts and rocks. To keep the horses going steady, the driver did not over navigate them. So they didn't stay away from every bump and every hole. One time, Charlie went to put the brake on. And as he put the brake down, there was a, the wheel went down into a big hole and he flew up in the air three to four feet, held down to the reins and landed right back down on the box. To the surprise of all the passengers, the horses never flinched. Another time he actually got thrown off the stage and was dragged in the dirt, which is really dangerous. He held on to the reins, he called to the horses, he used his whip and the horses settled down quickly. He was a little scraped up. And so the passengers so impressed with his courage and so impressed with his ability to bring those horses back under control while being dragged, passed a hat and put money into it and gave him a nice substantial reward in honor of what he had done. There were highway robbery men on all those roads, as you can imagine, because it was the gold rush and the stagecoaches were taking gold back down to the city. Wells Fargo as the company had ordered all of the stagecoach drivers that if you get held up, throw the box down, don't fight, because they didn't want a single passenger to get shot by accident or hurt. It's too big of a liability. So one time Charlie was on the road, good control of the horses, came around the blind corner in the Sierra, and there he was, Sugarfoot, the famous Sugarfoot. Throw down the box. Charlie was mad, but had to do it. Threw down the box and then all the passengers were robbed of their possessions as well. He was angry and he told Sugarfoot, I'll see you again. About a month later, Sugarfoot dared to try to hold up Charlie's stage again. And Charlie had tucked a six, shooter down near his foot. He picked it up quickly, shot Sugarfoot, and then took the whip and got the horses to run out of there, leaving him behind in a cloud of dust. The next day, the body of Sugarfoot was found on the road. Well, word spread quickly among all of the robbers and highway robbery men, stay away from Charlie. And it was easy to stay away from Charlie because he was so recognizable. He only had one eye, a patch on his left eye, he always wore a big, thick, double-breasted coat, woolen, and he always wore a great big hat pulled down low over his face. So when they saw Charlie, they would just step back into the bushes and let that stage go and wait for another one to rob. There were dangers of the road as well, grizzlies, rattlesnakes, snakes, things that scared the horses. 
Horses were especially scared of bridge crossings and rivers. One time, it was flood stage on the Tuolumne River. The river was just roaring down the canyon, but they had to get across. They had mail, they had gold, they had passengers. So Charlie took the horses down to a slow walk and steadily walked them across the bridge while the river was raging around them. Halfway across the river, Charlie felt the bridge move slightly, just a little sway. And so he pulled out the whip and lashed it high. The horses took off with their full speed and made it to the other side, obeying the command immediately. And just as they got to the shore on the other side of the river, the horrible crashing splintering sound of the bridge breaking up in the turmoil of the river shocked all the passengers. All of these stories about Charlie were told all over California because when they would come to a station, which was about every 20 miles and change horses, the passengers would get out of the stage and tell what had happened and tell what Charlie had done to save them. Well, over time, we all get old and Charlie developed some rheumatism in his ancient years. And so he realized he didn't have that same dexterity and control of the reins that he wanted. So he retired to the coast of California here near Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Moss Landing, ran a cattle ranch, had a good friend who owned um, another ranch and gave him a cabin to live behind their family home, became good close friends with the family and their son. Unfortunately, Charlie had been a tobacco chewer most of his life. And so he ended up with cancer. And as he got sicker and sicker, the young ranch hand boy took good care of him. So Charlie left him a lot of money when he died. When Charlie closed his eyes for the last time, he wasn't alone, he was with that family. But the story doesn't end there. When Charlie died, it was revealed that Charlie, the courageous, strong, capable stagecoach driver known all over California with all of these adventures and skills had done it all with one big secret. And that big secret, Charlie Parkhurst was a woman. Well, it made the papers, as you can imagine, nationwide. There were writings all about it. Some people didn't believe it. People who knew him didn't believe it. He had hidden himself for 50 years back east and then out here in California for over 30 years throughout the Sierra Nevada and up and down the coast. One of the writers in the newspaper wrote about him and said, now look at this. What they say a woman cannot do, a woman has done. All hail to Charlie Parkhurst. Yeah. I recall in the in the reading about Charlie Parkhurst that uh, Charlie had voted in the uh, presidential election. That's right, yeah. 100 years before women's suffrage. And there's a plaque on, I think it's a firehouse in Aptos or along there somewhere that, or Soquel, that says this is where the polling place was. And you can go see that little bronze plaque, a historical marker. Yeah, he's buried um, in Watsonville in the Pioneer Cemetery. Well, he, I, I meant she, she is buried yeah. in Watsonville Cemetery. A story came out after she died uh, that um, there was a family that knew that um, he was a woman, that he had helped a widow and her son at a stage stop and had gotten drunk. He didn't get drunk very often, but he'd gotten drunk one night and passed out. And so the woman had said, help Charlie get undressed and uh, dragged him into bed and, and came running out, mom, mom, Charlie's not a man. And, and so they decided after talking about it because they loved Charlie and they knew him well to just keep his secret until after he died. Good story, <laughs> well told, thank you. Right now, we have a quick announcement and uh, Sherry, please. Yeah, 
Uh, we've been working really hard on our Auburn Winter Storytelling Festival. It's coming up in January. This will be our seventh time. Uh, we are going to do it on Zoom again this year, which is not quite as as wonderful as in person, but uh, we hope that uh, some of you will uh, sign up and come and uh, tell some stories. We're going to have stories for children and families in the morning from 1230 to 2. Ed Lewis is going to teach a storytelling workshop on nuts and bolts for anyone who's maybe a beginner or wanting to get a little better at storytelling. Open telling in the afternoon. He will come tell, tell a tall tale or a personal tale or uh, anything that you want to talk about. And then in the evening at seven o'clock, we'll have five professional storytellers. So uh, afternoon and evening of uh, storytelling and it's free and you have to register at Eventbrite. So I hope we see some of you there. Thank you, Sherry. It is a wonderful event. We enjoy doing it live for, I don't know, six or seven years. And sometimes we'd have as many 300 people show up in little old Auburn for our storytelling. And, and we, can, we can handle that many online. So you're all welcome. <laughs> now, our Foothill Guild's fourth and last but not least teller this evening is Alicia Retes. Now, Alicia enjoys performing stories of tricksters and shapeshifters like Coyote and Raven and Rabbit and many others. They are extremely fun. Her North American indigenous roots are with the Yoremi, commonly known as the Mayo, and the Oemi, commonly known as Yaki, from Sonora in Sinaloa, Mexico. The story that she's going to share with us tonight originates with the Hopi people, and it features Skeleton Man and Coyote Woman. Take it away, Alicia. Thank you. I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Coast Miwok people. I bring you a Hopi story. Ma Sao. Ma Sao, a Hopi cultural hero, also known as Skeleton Man and Lord of the dead, who teaches people to live a simple, self-sufficient life in harmony with one's environment. He lets the people know the dangers in the world and he promotes the arts of agriculture. He offers a bag of seed, a gourd of water, a digging stick and a cloak. And although skeleton man can be Mm, terrifying. There's another side to him. Beneath that mask, he's been described as quite handsome, wearing colorful beads. And he's one to take care of not only the earth, but one who can be trusted to care, care of the Hopi people in their afterlife. He's also known as a trickster, like much like Coyote and all the others causing mischief. This evening, I've called upon the spirit of Squash Man. Now, Squash Man is green and yellow. And Squash Man has seeds inside his gourd. His job is to ensure successful crops, as I have him to ensure a successful telling of Skeleton Man and Coyote Woman. In the before time, when time was not locked in a clock, mm. time was considered an integral partner with the sacred forces of nature. Time was on the winds 
announcing the changing of the seasons, blowing our skins cold, cool, warm, or hot. Time directed everyone and everything according to the changing of the seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. In this before time, everyone listened to the messages carried on the winds, for listening is loving. This is when our story begins. Skeleton man and coyote woman lived in the same neighborhood of the Hopi nation, the peaceful people. One day, coyote woman was out hunting. She has nine pups awaiting her. She'd been out all morning and into the late afternoon and hadn't caught a thing. She was very frustrated. So she came and she sat again along the edge of the canyon wall and she sniffed and she scanned and she sniffed and she scanned and still there was nothing, but she noticed the place where Skeleton Man sometimes dances. And Skeleton Man was there. He had entered his circle to dance. Well, being curious, Skeleton Woman had to get closer. Indeed, she did. Now, after a while, Skeleton Man began to sing. hi ya ya hi ya ha ha hi now, Skeleton Man doesn't have eyes. He's a skeleton. But he has eye sockets. And when he sings this song and does his special dance, eyes pop out of his eye sockets. Wet, round, firm, cords dangling, these eyes traveled south. Now, Skeleton Man would stay in his dance spot. And even though he remained there, he could see everything that the eyes were seeing. And soon those eyes had passed the mesa and the desert and past the canyon and near the mountains. And here he saw beautiful meadows and he saw rabbits and a river filled with fish. Now, Skeleton Woman knew this because when Skeleton Man saw all these things, he spoke about them. Oh, 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 oh yes, yes, yes. Look at all those rabbits. Oh, oh my. Oh, such fat deer. <laughs> oh, that river, so many fish. It looks silver. Oh. Now, Coyote Woman was getting very impatient, but at last Skeleton Man sang his song again. And now his eyes appeared in the distance and came towards Coy uh, Skeleton Man and they back into his eye sockets. Whew. Coyote Woman was salivating, not just with hunger, but with envy. She had to have this power. And she didn't want to just go ask him. No, she figured she had to flatter him or trick him somehow. So she came up to Coyote, to Skeleton, and said, <laughs> Well, Skeleton, man, I, I heard you're singing. And, oh, so beautiful. What a beautiful song you have. <laughs> Skeleton, man, just nodded. Oh, my. Well, if. I had such a song, <laughs> just saying with my beautiful voice, I could get all that game. I, I mean, others would just love to hear me sing that song. <laughs> the skeleton man just ignored her. Oh, um, I would be honored if you would teach me that song. I've handled magic before like that. Well, skeleton decided to teach her the song. Well, she no sooner learned it that she started to head off to go sing it. And Skeleton Man said, Haki, Haki, wait, wait. You must go to the side of the Arroyo. Face the south when you sing. And when you're ready for your eyes to return, sing the song and they will come back to you. And then he left. The skeleton, that woman, Coyote woman ran over to that spot and she sang her song and sure enough, her eyes popped out and they traveled 
round, wet, firm cords dangling. And they traveled and they traveled. And pretty soon she saw everything that, Ky that Skeleton had seen. She saw rabbits and she was moving about and trying to remember everything where all the game was. And then, well, the sun was coming down. And so she figured she'd better get back to her cub, her pups. And so she sang the song to call her eyes back, but they didn't return. So she sang again. She sang again and louder. Still, the eyes did not return. And she realized she had been moving around and probably wasn't facing south, but the eyes have to return. So she felt down on the ground and sure enough, wet, round, firm, cords dangling, and she popped one eye in. And then she used that eye to find the other wet, round, oh, there it is, and she popped it in. But something was wrong. Ow, oh, everything is yellow. How strange. Must be the light of the sun. I'll figure it out in the morning. I got to get back to my pups. And she ran off that way. Now, Skeleton Man was hidden nearby and he was laughing really hard because Coyote Woman had picked up yellow gourds and popped them in into her eyes. <laughs> Good trick on her. Well, Coyote Woman ran back and she got into the den and she greeted her pups. And when they saw those terrifying yellow eyes, well, they screamed in fright and they ran out of the den and they just kept running. And Coyote Woman went after them. She tried to get them, but none of them would return. And this is why we have coyotes in all everywhere in the lower 48 states. Now, the next time you get the feeling that someone is watching you might just be coyote woman's eyes still wandering around story done <laughs> thank you alicia <laughs> i love your characters and your songs and your stories and thank you for sharing the heritage with us as My well pleasure. as that wonderful story thank you very much thank you for having me and it's an honor to be here thank you Thank you. Okay, well, that's Great it Halloween for the time videos, Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, Mark, your, your tellers have been wonderful. We've got one more for you. Lori Great. Pines, another well-established member of the South Bay Storytellers and Listeners. She's been involved with storytelling in the area for more than 20 years. She's even told stories um, in her classroom and in various places around the world. And she has served on the SAC board. But tonight, Lori is going to tell us a true story of a truly talented man with a truly unusual name. Lori Pines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, Tom and Sandy and Mark, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, Really, this has been wonderful. I see Tom and Sandy, I don't see me. So do you guys see me? We see you loud and clear. Oh, great. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. So perhaps you don't know that there once was a man who was called Big Cheeks. This is a true story. Big Cheeks was the grandson of a slave. He was born in a tough and dangerous area in New Orleans called Battleground. His father abandoned the family when he was still a baby and his mother she took the only job she knew. She became a prostitute. And so Big Cheeks and his sister had to move in with his grandmother. At a very young age, it became very obvious 
that Big Cheeks had a special talent for music. And at the age of six, he and three other friends would stand on the corner in New Orleans and sing. And people would pass and stop and throw coins. It was the first money they had ever earned. <laughs> and rumor has it that the way he got big cheeks, he would take these coins and to make sure they weren't stolen, he'd stuff them in his cheeks. Well, around the same time, a Jewish family, the Karnikovs, emigrated to New Orleans from Lithuania. And they saw and heard this young boy on the corner and they took pity on him and they invited him into their home. At first they gave him light jobs to do in their industry and in their home to earn his room and board, but he soon became a part of the family. It was the first time he was taught loving kindness and determination. Mrs. Karnikov would sit at night and sing him Jewish Russian songs and he would immediately sing them with her. They became part of his musical entity, all that he had. This young boy grew up to be a musician and a composer. He composed over 50 songs. And 1964, when the Beatles were, wow, you know, at the top of the charts, one of his songs, Hello Dolly, kicked them off the very top and became number one. He was featured in 12 full length movies with Barbara Streisand, Frank Sinatra, and Grace Kelly. As a famed musician, he got to spend time with Pope. Pius XII and Pope Paul VI. Big Cheeks never forgot the Jewish family that took him in and began his life as a musician and a kind, loving person. He took part in the 1960s in the civil rights movements. As a memory to this Jewish family, he always wore the Star of David around his neck. And he spoke fluent Yiddish. Now, perhaps you have an idea who this young boy grown into this musician composer is. It was Louis Satchmo Armstrong. And Satchmo, that's Yiddish for big cheeks. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the time when if we were in person, we'd get all the storytellers up on the stage and we'd all bow together, holding hands and, and, and we'd bow once and we'd bow twice about that. And there'd be thunderous applause from everybody for the wonderful job that all the storytellers have been doing. So we'll do a little twinkling here and say thank you all so much for coming. And thank you all the storytellers for your wonderful tales. Now, I have permission to remind you that, as Zach requested, we have recorded this 
That recording will go to uh, Ed Lewis and Shags and the, uh, the SAC um, organization. And if for some, if you do not want your part among the tellers included in the your archive. archives or, or released beyond that, or, or you have questions about that, Shags is, and Ed Lewis are the per people to talk to to uh, confirm what your wishes are. We were asked to record, and I'd post said at the beginning that we were recording, and the recording was on. You could, uh, the button was on during this. So um, that is at, per SAC's request for celebrations. We have recorded it at least for archival purposes, but beyond that, you uh, talk to Shags if you have questions or, or wish to have your part not included in any uh, anything that's that is released or shared. Now on Saturday, the 20th of November, mm -hmm. we're having a special storytelling uh, gathering on our what would have be our usual celebration time. Well, except it'd be four in the afternoon. Yeah, because we're inviting storytellers who were mentored as youth by Joy Swift to come and tell stories. And Mia Lieberman lives uh, back east. And in so Boston. We, and so we have to get in her time zone. <laughs> so we're doing it at four o'clock in the afternoon. And we're asking our tellers to think of stories that have to do with mentoring and, and guiding. Though many stories have a mentoring portion to them. Right. So this is half a dozen storytellers from the over the history of South Bay storytelling and listeners. Uh, starting from the 1990s uh, to current, uh, one of whom, Tricia, was on the uh, Menlo Park, Menlo Park program. program this evening. Um, so they will be our uh, featured tellers group one after another on the 20th in the afternoon, four in the afternoon. We haven't put out, the, uh, haven't made up the flyer on this one event at a time for me. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you all. And don't forget to set your clocks back. We get an extra hour tonight as we lose.